Today, we're going to be talking about advancing women in tech as both a goal and as an organization. We're going to be talking with the founder and board chair of AWIT, which works to empower women and members of other underrepresented groups to the highest level of tech leadership. So stay tuned. Hey everybody, this is Chris Brandt with Sunish Patel. Welcome to another Future Tech video podcast. We are very privileged to have with us Nancy Wang. Nancy may be one of the busiest people in the world of tech. She has led product development for Google, Rubrik, and is now general manager of AWS Data Protection and Governance. She also works on the investment side, is on multiple boards, writes for Forbes, and develops education programs with the University of Pennsylvania. Today, however, we are going to be talking with Nancy about Advancing Women in Technology, or AWIT, a 20,000-strong organization that she is very passionate about. We're going to be talking about the challenges facing women advancing in technology leadership and what she is doing to raise women and other marginalized people up. Welcome, Nancy. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me, Chris. I'm really excited to speak to your audience today. Yeah, and thanks. Like I said, I think you may be the busiest person you know out there. So I really appreciate you uh, taking the time <laughs> no, no, to be it's, with us. It's called having a, a ton of interest and wishing that I had the time turner from Harry Potter to create thirty six <laughs> hours in my day. And I'm still trying to find a solution to that. So yeah, if you well, that, know the answer. Let me know. Yeah, well, you know, you're at AWS, so you might be able to figure that out. Before we get going on all this, can you just talk a little bit about um, what drove you to start? Uh, a, a wit, you know, like what was what was going on that you saw that you're like, it's time to start an organization right now. First off, of course, right, starting any idea from scratch. I mean, it's hard. There's a lot of people who ask me, you know, why did I sort of solve the need, right? What problem did I think that I was positioned to solve? And it really comes from you know being there, right? Personal identification. So this was back when I was a product manager at Google. In fact, one of my first product management jobs, if not the first. And so just looking at the product managers I worked with, product leadership, engineering leadership, there were a lot of great mentors and folks who were super welcoming, right? Extending in hand, helping me after hours. But there weren't quite that many individuals who identified with me. And more specifically, identified with my gender. And maybe things have certainly changed, right, in the industry. However, with that said, still, you know, don't take my word for it. Look at stats, look at numbers. There's so many published reports, especially during this pandemic that we're all in, of saying how far we've fallen behind, right? Mm -hmm. We haven't made that many strides forward, and yet we're worse off than we were back in the 80s. Right. So this really issue or, or gap that you see in representation of women in the highest uh, levels of leadership in tech is a problem that needs to be solved. And, and why? Right. So obviously you can point to the bottom line. Right. More diverse companies fare better. Right. On mm -hmm. the P&L, um, you know, better attraction to customers. But it really comes down to equity. Right. Hmm. If we can't demonstrate that we can find people of different genders or ethnic backgrounds or uh, whatever you know underrepresented group they may belong to, then that sends a strong signal to the next generations coming up through the pipeline that, hey, this is the end all be all. Right. This is a level that you're never going to move beyond. So that's what I wanted to change. And that was the real reason. Right. Founding Advancing Women in Tech back in 2017. Well, you know, I, I mean, I've seen, you know, firsthand, you know, the challenges for women in tech. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of um, male-dominated culture in, in tech often. Um, and, I, and it's funny because, you know, some of the earliest programmers were women. You know, that was kind of, you know, who started a lot of the, this, uh, the tech world um, and, and were, you know, eventually, you know, marginalized to a great extent. Now, you said something I want to just kind of touch on. You said, like, since the 80s, you, you, you feel like there's been a decline. Could you speak to that a little bit and, like, what maybe the factors were in that? Sure. So, you know, if you, there's so many studies that have been done throughout the decades, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not going to quote exact numbers, 
for fear of being off, right? But if you look at just the percentage of people who identified as female in leadership roles, often you can say, hey, anyone with PL ownership, right, is in a senior executive role. Sure. So if you take that percentage, right, it used to be 20, 30% back in the 80s. Now we're really looking around, right? I mean, again, don't take my word for it. You can look up Fortune 500, see who's on their boards, see who's on their C suites, and specifically for individuals who are either chief technology officers, chief product officers, again, folks with PL ownership or the CEO uh, herself, there's not that much representation. In fact, actually, we've taken steps be behind, and it's certainly lower than 20%. One might even argue for the Fortune 500s, it's less than 10%. So hmm. faced with those facts and figures, right, clearly something's broken, right? Clearly there's a problem, and we need to examine what are we doing to solve that problem, right? Obviously, it's not going to be immediate because you're not going to, you know, just magically, you know, conjure, right, uh, dozens of female executives. But what are we doing to folks who are in the middle of their careers, right? Potentially folks who have that high potential, that aptitude, right, that ability to, to work hard to get to that next level, making sure that they don't fall through the cracks. And that's the explicit problem that I'm trying to solve. And there's a couple ways uh, that I'm thinking about solving that problem. One, of course, is upskilling, because as mm -hmm. one moves through the step functions in their career, there's different skills that you need, whether it's as a very senior IC where you're making decisions that impact maybe millions or hundreds of millions of dollars on the balance sheet, or perhaps you're a big org leader, right, where you manage and lead hundreds, thousands of individuals, right? Different skills are needed. And so how does one go about getting those skills? Well, today, a lot of that is tribal knowledge. So mm. that's what I've tried to do is put that tribal knowledge into workshops, into content that is easily accessible via Coursera. You simply can just go to Coursera.org backslash AWIT and find those materials. I'll right? put a link. Um, sure. And and of course, uh, another big angle is that of executive mentorship, because sure, you can read books and, and watch all the videos and learning content you can find online. But if there's not that person who's willing to, to come out and say, hey, you know, I'm willing to put my own career, my own reputation on the line for you, right, for your results and be responsible for that. Well, you can be the most skilled person ever, but not have a chance to move up. Right. So it's why these two need to work in hand, hand in hand tandem for someone to advance. And so that's our philosophy. And that's what we try to put in practice every day at AWIT. You know, tribal knowledge is, is obviously a really important piece of this. Um, and you, you mentioned that, you know, you're building courses to, to teach that tribal knowledge. What, what does that look like? Sure. So, for example, one course that's under development at the moment, it's our third specialization, deals explicitly with the concept of how does one move from an individual contributor into a people manager? Mm. Other courses that we already have online, for example, teach around the business of leadership or uh, you know, creating your own vision. So it goes around that. But this is one that we've developed that really hits the problem square on the nose. And the reason for that is when we examine individuals on their way to leadership, in fact, actually, one of my favorite exercises is looking at leaders' profiles on LinkedIn. Why? Because it's a recipe for how did they get to their current position, being a, a CXO or a, a founder of a super successful company. What moves did they make in their career that ultimately led them to where they are today? And for often, most of these individuals, you see that major step function from being, let's say, a senior engineer or a product manager or a senior product manager into a manager of product management or into an engineering manager. And from then on, sure, the step functions are, you know, every five years, I'm sure they get promoted to a more senior executive role. But it's that really that first inflection point that's the most important. And if you're lucky enough, right, have the right skills and the right executive sponsorship to make that leap let's say earlier in your career, then you have much longer runway to make those subsequent step functions to eventually get into the senior executive suite. And that's really what we're focused on is what skills do you need to demonstrate readiness for management? Because it's not like, you know, even for myself, right, when I'm looking at high potential individuals on my team to tap and say, hey, you should be a people manager, you have such talent. Well, 
I need to see proof points of this talent because it's also a big responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. You're not only determining other people's careers, but oftentimes, right, you're also managing their compensation, managing their performance evaluations. And you yourself, as a people manager, have a huge hand in how your own team develops their careers. So it's not a decision that anyone would take lightly. So then comes back, right, the chicken and the egg story of, well, then how do you demonstrate such proof points of being ready for a people management role? Mm -hmm. And so it's helping these individuals learn, okay, what are some maybe uh, indicators, right, that your leadership would look for, right, that I look for using personal anecdotes, right? Or, for example, what skills would you need in people leadership? And there's so many great resources out there of being empathetic leader, of perhaps the, the right framework to think about leadership, right? Are you an advisor? Are you a director, right? Or are you simply a consultant? Right? What levels of leadership or leadership skills do you need to make that first leap? leap? That sounds that sounds like an incredibly valuable uh, course. I wish I had that available to me. No, uh, me by. too. <laughs> In fact, actually, Chris, you know, that's the exact rubric that I, I use to uh, determine, hey, is this something worthwhile for me to go develop? Because, I mean, there's already a ton of great resources out there, right? The last yeah. thing I want to do is, is spend time developing something that is already pretty great and already out there. But it's really, what did I wish I knew when I was going through my career? And if there's nothing out there like it, well, I'm going to go and develop it. Well, and, and I think you'd have a good sense of that because, you know, when you look at your career, um, you span across so many different aspects from investing to engineering. I mean, you're both tech and business and, you know, you've got a lot of things going on. Um, so I, I think you've had a, an interesting career trajectory. So I'm sure you have a lot to add on that front, right? Well, it's, a, it's about, uh, you know, just passions, right? I, I feel like a lot of probably one of the most frequently asked questions that I have for myself is, how do you balance it all? And, <laughs> and it really comes down to mindset, right? Yeah. Is I find that the most successful individuals, however you measure success by wealth or by achievement or accomplishment or combination of both, right. Right, which it usually is, is folks who are always in that perpetual learner or that a perpetual curiosity mindset are often the folks who succeed the most, right? And so for me, whether I look at my you know full-time role with AWS or my involvement with AWIT or now the board advisory roles that I have with Penn Engineering or my uh, part-time role with Felices, whatever it might be, right? I look at all of those as what am I going to learn today? Right. For example, this morning, you know, I, I got schooled by a, a technical, you know, vice president on the ins and outs of uh, Aurora. Right. That was mm -hmm. fascinating. It's like, wow, that's really cool. Right. How you do imagination. So, you know, you never know what you're going to learn on a day to day basis. And I think it's that uh, mindset of curiosity and wonder that, in my opinion, right, if you're looking to move that next level, it's no not so much, hey, the fixation on, oh, I'm going to be a level seven, eight, 10, whatever, right? But really, what am I going to learn at that next stage that I don't know now? I, I think that's so well said, because I think you're so spot on with that. I think curiosity is like the most important factor to success. I think curiosity and the willingness to take a risk, right? Willingness to, willingness to fail. You know, my, my kids are in a Montessori program and they have on the board, it's like, this is a mistake-making place. And you have to be able to, you know, to push your limits and to be curious and, and, and discover new things, you have to be able to willing to step over those and, and fail occasionally uh, and be comfortable with that, I think. Right. Absolutely. And, and most importantly, which is I find one of the ways that, you know, again, I've been just super lucky to be surrounded with very talented individuals on my own leadership staff, right, who then manage their own teams and other managers is admitting what you don't know. Right. Mm -hmm. So and there's this adage goes, right. No one is good at everything. And if you say you are, well, you're lying. <laughs> so, you know, just knowing, being very honest with yourself of what are your strengths, because clearly you bring something unique to the table, but also very honest with yourself and others of, well, what are you not strong at? And hire around those, right? That's my biggest advice to new managers is, it, people aren't going to trust you, right? You're not going to build trust by saying that you know everything because no one does. But it's rather of doing the things that you know really, really well and then hiring, right? Or aggrandizing around the areas that you may not be as strong in and together form a very strong team that is good at everything. 
And I, and I wanted to, to loop back on something else you, you talked about that I think is really interesting. And, and maybe if you could sort of explain how that works a little bit better. But, you know, the, the concept of executive sponsorship, right? And, you know, like, I think, you know, we, we think of like, oh, well, that's, you know, just an executive hiring me into a position. But I think it's a lot more than that, right? I mean, it's like, you know, inviting you to speak at a meeting or inviting you to a meeting, even, you know, like some of the little things that are kind of ongoing, right? I mean, could you speak to that a little bit? For a lot of people, it's it's sort of that, you know, mythical creature of, okay, how, <laughs> I'm going to raise my hand and, and perhaps I'm lucky enough to get an executive sponsor. Uh, fortunately, it's not that cut and dry, right? Yeah. Because first off, maybe we can start with what is the difference between an executive mentor and executive sponsor? Yes. Right? An executive mentor, and I think I heard the best definition of this a couple of days ago, is someone who answers multiple questions for you, right? Not just one question for you. And I certainly have many, many of these wonderful individuals in my life who I can go to for career advice, right? Should I, you know, expand my businesses here? Should I look at this job offer? Whatever it might be, right? Throughout my career. But they're very different from individuals who've clearly taken that next step, right? Into saying, well, I'm willing, right, to bet my own reputation on this unproven person, right, in order to take this job. And, you know, I've, I've been very fortunate to have that, but it certainly didn't come from me raising my hand as I need to be sponsored, right? And poof, right, here comes my sponsor. It, it was a trust relationship. And I come mm -hmm. back to that a lot because as, frankly, an executive, your biggest currency is trust, right? It's not how much money you're able to make the company because sometimes you may be an executive in a pre-revenue company, but it's really about the trust that you build with your team, with your own leadership, with external customers, right? That's why reputation is, such a big deal, right, to, yeah. to executives and, and folks that I coach who want to become executives. So for me personally, right, it was a, a month, multiple months long uh, relationship, you know, with my current manager who, you know, we worked on many projects together. And I, I you know, bet, you know, off the path, right, he didn't look at me and say, okay, this unproven individual, I'm going to bet my reputation on her. Well, didn't happen that way, right? It's through multiple uh, projects, multiple proof points of, you know, I'm willing to put in the work, right? I can achieve you the same results as maybe you hiring someone perhaps uh, decades older, right? With much more experience because look, the saying goes, no one ever got fired for uh, buying IBM, right? So right. there's that same adage as well. There are many seasoned executives who could be sitting in my seat right now, right? But yet the a, or his willingness to take on a risk, right, and have me in the seat instead, well, that trust needs to be built. You know, you, you mentioned, you know, a few things that can kind of help move the, move the needle, but like, what, what are some of the biggest challenges you see for women in tech right now? You know, I've been having this uh, conversation thread with multiple women leaders, actually, over the last month, because, frankly, I want to pick their minds and see what they thought about it, is I am, frankly, concerned. I'm concerned, probably even scared, about the after effects, the lingering after effects of COVID and a fully remote environment, mm. right? I know that there are many perks, trust me, um, as someone who is constantly running errands in between meetings or doing, you know, other side hobbies, right? I get that, right? I'm the first to tell you being able to work remote, amazing. However, right, if you look at folks who are in, you know, my position or my peers, well, we've already gone through that inflection point, right? We have that proof point. If you're a um, someone who have who has just started her career, maybe potentially out of grad school or even undergrad, you're not going to have the guts to reach out to me on Slack, right? Hey, Nancy, what up? Right? Like, very few people do that, right? right. Then that creates an issue or a vacuum where the more junior individuals who are in most need of that mentoring, of that sponsorship, no longer have that bridge. Right? Mm. Because I can say that from personal experience, for example, the relationships that I've built over the years with my mentors or various sponsors throughout my career were, for, were from personal interactions, right? Staying behind at work or uh, showing up extra early to have that 10 minute long conversation or a um, chance to grab coffee. Well, that doesn't exist anymore because everything mm -hmm. is virtual. So it really then creates a bias almost towards individuals who are more potentially extroverted, who are more aggressive, right, or assertive around right. reaching out to mentors. A lot of what you're talking about, Nancy, is you really leveraging your network. It seems like you've built a great network. And 
Chris and I talk about this often. Um, so can you speak a little bit to like, how do you build a strong network and, and, and how, you know, how do you leverage that network in your career? Initially, right. Again, going back to, uh, potentially personalities that work out well is I, Initially, right, I was scared to reach out as well to executives or to people who I thought were lady bosses because I was afraid of them saying, well, I don't have time or no, right? And yes, I have gotten many of those uh, responses throughout my career. With that said, I've just stopped caring, right? So it's that <laughs> shameless, I'm still going to reach out because the worst you can say is no. And it's really that mindset that I think will help a lot of people make those connections, right? Because I'm, I know I'm not a good fit for mentee for everybody. Just like I'm not going to be a good mentor for everybody. With that said, it's a lot like almost dating, right? In the sense of finding the right fit for you of there's got to be some, you know, personal, obviously jiving going on, right? Maybe you share the same background or for example, I'm really good friends with a few founders who were also immigrants to this country, right? It's a shared mm -hmm. personal experience that brings us together, right? Because really what you're striving at, honestly, at the end of the day is a personal a non-transactional, authentic relationship. And you certainly don't get there by starting out transactional. So for example, I'll actually quote one of my mentors here is he mentioned to me, right, way back when, a mentee-mentor relationship is never equal because you will never bring as much value to your mentor in strict value terms as your mentor will bring to you. I know that sounds really harsh when you say it that way, but honestly, if you internalize it, well, it's true, right? And yeah. so it's not that, hey, I need to bring as much value to my mentor as they could possibly bring to me, but it's rather about recognizing where your value lies, right? So for that mentor explicitly, he's an angel investor invested in tons of Bay Area companies. So every time I would meet up with him for coffee, I would either bring up founder names he should meet with or different startup companies that perhaps he hasn't heard of that he might find interesting. And that was my va uh, way of delivering value in the ways that I could. And if your mentor sees that you know, you're making an honest effort to make it a personal relationship, a less transactional, you'll very see quickly uh, reciprocation, right? And that's mm -hmm. really where the, you create a mentoring relationship that will last decades. Yeah, it's just hard to do. You know, one of those, in developing a network and developing all that, you Chris and I talk about just the whole fact of being likable. You know, I know some people don't like that word, but, you know, sometimes um, you meet people that are extremely smart, you know, so talented in so many ways, but they sometimes struggle with connecting with other people. And, and it's a shame because they have a lot of good stuff, you know, but if you can't communicate with people and build trust and build rapport and teamwork, you know, I, I, I often see that's part of the challenge that we get with a lot of you know, gifted people, uh, quite honestly, in our industry, you know, you know, and you can't always be looking at your network as what can I get out of this person? You know, it's a completely different perspective. For me, it's always when somebody does something nice for me, I feel indebted to them, right? And I, I, I feel like, oh, man, I should I got to do something for this person, right? Because they've helped me so much. I mean, on that note, actually, being likable starts with you, right? Really like just yourself. Because I feel that a lot of folks, especially at this age of, you know, being virtual where all you see is this, right? You don't know how tall I am or <laughs> how wide I am, I guess. Oh, let's not think about that. <laughs> right? It's to be genuinely you, right? They think that they have to fit into some box or category. But I mean, if you've been around the block a couple times, right? And I'm sure we all have, you see through that really quickly. And it's really the folks who are un- abashedly themselves, right? And for example, I'm a little geeky, I know. I'm slightly socially awkward. It's okay, I'm comfortable with that, right? And just being comfortable with who you are, that's actually how you bring likability because you introduce that really valuable aspect of being authentically you. That is a problem that a lot of people struggle with in in, in tech in particular. And I, and I know that like, you know, I mean, I gotta imagine, you know, like considering some of the the environment of the tech industry, um, you know, for, for some women, that's got to be really hard balance to strike. Absolutely. Look, I mean, when I first started out in tech, Chris, I went and changed my entire wardrobe, right? I'm, you ask anyone who knows me, 
I'm a huge girly girl, right? I always want to get my nails done. I love dressing up. <laughs> I'm usually the only person in the AWS office that wears heels, and everybody can hear me walking from <laughs> 10 meters away. With that said, but when I first started out in tech, I did have this image in my head of, oh, I'm changing industries now from the federal government into the tech space. I need to look a certain way. So I went out and bought athleisure, right? I, I never wear athleisure to work, but I changed my entire wardrobe. And there was about 18, 24 months where I didn't feel myself. I didn't feel that great. I felt like I had to sound a certain way, had to act a certain way. And it wasn't until, again, one of my awesome mentors is like, why are you doing this? Why do you feel like you can't be you and still be successful? And it's really when I started embracing the me, right, that I, I do feel like my career has actually gone in an even more accelerated upward trend because I'm willing to embrace my weaknesses, but also parts where I, I am strong in. I think that that's awesome. And I, and I want to, you know, like also talk about something that you mentioned earlier that I think is a really interesting concept the idea of like empathetic leadership. Right. And I think when you know, you're, 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 um, talking about all of these kinds of dynamics and, you know, the sort of getting the mentorship and getting these things. It's like, I think, you know, like having empathetic leadership is extraordinarily important in that regard. Right. Cause, um, to, these are challenging things for a lot of people and you have to have a leadership that's that's kind of understanding some of the challenges that people are having and kind of you know pulling them along a little bit as well right absolutely i mean this goes back into inclusivity right because and and it was also a very personal learning as well so for example when i first uh began my journey of being a gm at aws right i had this fledgling team in fact actually it was a management turnover and that was the truth is that the former manager left i suddenly found myself managing 29 individual <laughs> engineers so uh, great experience we'll never do again do not recommend <laughs> uh so yeah it was a tough time i remember having one-on-ones every two weeks with every person all 29 of them on my team oh wow and you know what that taught me was look right we're clearly driving hard you know aws is a culture of going really fast well i was in one of probably the fastest teams at a fast company because we're yeah. meant to start this new business leadership had big hopes i of course didn't want to succeed and disappoint my sponsor right and the story goes on and on and on and then came to a point where actually one of my uh, managers on who's still on my staff told me back then is Look, Nancy, if you're only going to hire people who work super hard, right, maybe answer your emails on the weekends, right, burn the midnight oil, you're going to end up with people who are exactly like you. And that's not healthy to the long term culture. And I'll admit it took me a week or two to really internalize his feedback. But it's so true, right? You have to recognize where people are coming from. And they're not all going to be, you know, like myself, right? Um, don't have kids, right? Have a very flexible schedule, have an understanding partner where I can work as long as I want, however I want, right? Mm -hmm. But most people don't have that luxury, right? Or they're just in different life stages. And so I recognize that, right? And that's why I'm super proud to say there's, you know, mothers on the team, right? There's, you know, fathers, there's people who've got taken leave, right? And come back. And it's really being understanding of where someone is in their career, right? Or their personal lives and understanding sometimes, you know, there's personal things that go on, especially in the time of COVID where mental health is so important. Like we just did yes. an offsite for my team leadership where we talked about emotional intelligence, about how to recognize burnout in both yourself and your teams, because it is a tough time, right? And again, going back to what I said earlier, some of the more junior folks in the team, I worry about them the most because imagine if you're just graduated from college, right? This is your first job. You're excited to be in tech, but you're stuck in your apartment all by yourself on a yeah. meeting and day full of just Zoom calls, right? Or chime calls, whatever, with, with no one else around you, right? And it's really those people that we have to be empathetic of and try to, you know, emphasize mental health and not so much a culture of, hey, you know, everyone has to be the same. You can't bring your full you to work. Yeah. Well, and, you know, on that note, too, I mean, you know, I know, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to sponsor a lot of, you know, women in leadership and executive leadership, but, you know, not everybody enjoys leadership either. You know, I, I think that's, that's a thing that, um, that's a trap I've seen a lot of people get into. They're like, where they like, they're like, well, now I got to be a manager. You know, mm -hmm. well, I've been an individual contributor and in doing something that I really love and I'm passionate about. Now I got to be the manager of all those people, right? Because that's 
what I'm supposed to do. But that's not the right path for everybody. Absolutely. Either. In fact, actually, very timely because I have an individual like that right now who I'm both mentoring and sponsoring who's on my team. And I've just had such a joy seeing her grow from, you know, she came in, was our engineer level two, which is your one level uh, beyond what new grads come in. And since then, we've helped her lead major projects. You know, she's also delivered them amazingly well, right? And uh, last quarter, we promoted her to senior software engineer. Super proud to see that. And so, yeah, she is looking at her next step and saying, okay, a lot of folks think that I should go into management because that's the only way to move up in my career ladder. But what if I actually like solving really complex technical challenges more? And so I'm like, hey, look, right, you're clearly gifted in both and take your time, right? It's not a rush decision. Talk to mm -hmm. people who are in both roles and really make that decision for you. Again, going back to what brings you the most joy. And if your joy comes from solving highly technical problems, well, then don't be a people manager, right? And this is where uh, around career conversations, in fact, actually, my team has a goal of having at least two career conversations a year with every employee. And I took on that goal this year because it's super important to me that people do know their options, that people management isn't the only way up, but that you can be a highly skilled individual contributor within that career ladder and just known for being very good at what you do. You have to have a certain amount of emotional intelligence to say, you know, this is what I really love and, and I'm going to be better doing this, even if it's not what the expected career path is necessarily, right? Helping folks understand what their career paths are. And even the, the example that we haven't talked about, right, is not so much an unintentional glass ceiling, but actually an intentional one. And that's mm. the last category that I've encountered more, more recently in my mentor-mentee relationships is someone saying, you know, I'm good, right? I, I don't want to get promoted. I like doing what I do because I look at the job responsibilities of someone in that next rung, and I'm not sure I want to do that, right? And that's not yeah. where, again, brings me joy. And then it becomes a conversation of, okay, how can I continue making you feel very fulfilled in your career without having to move you into your more senior role. So that's actually right. another, I would say, conversation that's evolved. But even then, right, it's still, you can still be a leader, right, by being really good at, again, what you do and being confident yeah. and continuing to be a role model for others. Great advice. Great advice. You've obviously been there and done it. So that, that, that helps. And I think that's one of the things that you talk about is that one of the, the, the advantages is that you're bringing to AWIT and a lot of the people who are involved with uh, AWIT is that you're, you're people who are in the industry currently, right? Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at myself, uh, obviously I'm still an operator, probably will ever, always be an operator, uh, even though my other identities of being on boards or uh, investing, right? They're they're really still much, very much tied or coexist with the greater identity of being an industry operator. And so, if you look at folks across the the board of directors at AWIT, they're either you know vice presidents at AWS, or they're founders, or they're entrepreneurs in residence at VC firms, uh, who've then started their own companies. So, and of course, that just gets magnified if you look at our ambassadors, who are executives who support our mission. Right? They're leaders from across every industry vertical at um, um, all, all around the world, geographically as well. And it's really that real life experience of, well, we're not just going to train you in an esoteric skill that, great, you can say you were certified and probably never use again. How many classes of that, like that, did we take in college, right? In grad school, a, a lot. But with that said, right, we try to teach you real world skills that, you know, many of my students, uh, for example, online or LinkedIn post tell me, you know what, I used that to get a job, or I used that the other day in my presentation to my boss and he loved it. Like, great, right? That's what I like to hear. And that's really what our ethos is, is we want to teach you real world skills. We want to provide you the opportunities to gain real world mentorship and sponsorship. If one wants to get involved with AWIT, AWIT, what, uh, what, would, what, would, what would they do to, to get, get involved? Sure. The easiest way is to go to our website at www.advancingwomenintech.org or find myself, uh, Nancy Wang, 
um, click on LinkedIn message. I love hearing from people or our also other uh, lady boss of the organization. Her name is Kate Watts. She comes from a higher educational background and you can also find her on LinkedIn and DM her as well. But either way, uh, you can learn more about the org through any way of these channels or if you look us up on Coursera as well. Um, so, so tell me what's next for AWIT? I sort of gave a uh, precursor to our third Coursera specialization on how to become a leader uh, in a te technical space as a people manager. There are also other collaborations that I'm super excited for, right? Chris, in your intro, you kindly mentioned that I'm on the advisory board for the uh, School of Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. Well, yeah. we're doing uh, something big with them this year, and we're actually kicking it off in a couple weeks, which is, again, bring that real world perspective via industry leaders from companies like Stripe, from PayPal, from AWS, and, and so many more, right, directly into contact with students in the Masters of CIS program. And something I'm super proud of is the online Masters of CIS program, which is actually a very different population. I'll explain why, is that these are full-time uh, professionals, so meaning they already have a full-time role, and yet they're taking on additional time to earn a Masters of Computer Science, right? And 42% of these students are women. And that's what caught my eye, is if you can bring real-world professionals and experts to these individuals. And... Uh, by selection, all of these, what we call executives and res residents that we're bringing to the University of Pennsylvania, all of them have the ability to hire, right? So if you're going to bring these hiring managers to 42%, you know, women, uh, student body, well, that means job opportunities, that means advancement opportunities. And so that's what we're launching with the university uh, in a couple of weeks. Super proud of that. And just looking forward to, you know, longer term, is we want to work with not just obviously, you know, world-class universities like Penn, where I went to school, so shameless plug there, but also <laughs> with uh, trade schools and local community colleges, because especially if we're looking at a population whose first degree was not in computer science or who have not had right the fortune to go to a four-year college and earn a CS degree, well, I want to open the doors for those individuals as well. And not to say that every job has to start with, let's say, a SDE or a software engineering job, you can start out as an associate solutions architect, as I've seen many folks uh, in the AWS Restart program do, or you could be a support engineer or any other role in tech. And eventually, I've seen folks who've worked their way up into being very successful senior leaders. And so I want to broaden, right, broaden the funnel and bring in more people and include more people. That's awesome. I mean, you're, you're doing really awesome cool stuff and, you know, got to applaud that. I, you know, I hope, and I'm sure it's going to just continue to grow and expand. Hey, and, and before we go, I, I know, you know, like your, your day gig, um, with Amazon, um, I know you guys have had some recent, you know, interesting announcements around S3 and things like that. I don't know if you want to, you know, give a plug for that one too. Sure. So putting my Amazon <laughs> hat on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, data protection, right? We, uh, Basically, in short, we protect customers' data and applications that are in the cloud, on-premises, or in hybrid clouds. Uh, why that's super important is, well, just look at what we're doing now, right? Video conferencing, and that's a lot of data that's being streamed across the internet, right? Storage uh, footprints have exploded for many of our largest customers. And not only do companies these days have to make sure that they're not vulnerable to attacks, but also with increasing privacy regulations and the right to be forgotten and data subject requests. Well, if I were to issue one, you need to know where in your data is my my personal information, what row, what column is it contained in, and be able yeah. to delete it. Otherwise, your company could be subject to fines. So in this evolving world of protection, privacy, security, you know, securing your data, there are so many opportunities for a cloud provider like AWS to bring that thought leadership. And so that's exactly what, you know, I again, find joy doing what my team does. <laughs> and so with launching a backup and protection for S3, that means S3, one of the, the largest data repositories uh, ever, right? And um, right. across cloud providers now have the ability to be, for example, sharded across multiple regions for additional redundancy, or for example, um, if there's any malicious actors or just even human actors and accidentally deleting a bucket or a very precious object, well, that's protected now. You know, you got a lot going on. 
<laughs> and it's and it's all pretty awesome. So I, I congratulate you on that. And I, I you know, thank you t- for taking some time out for us and really appreciate you being on. Really appreciate you sharing the wisdom and, uh, you know, keep keep up the good work. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Um, it's really folks like yourself who have given us a platform, right? The the loudspeaker to be able to, again, bring more into the fold to s- spread uh, and increase awareness that we're able to do what we do. So appreciate you, Chris, for having us on. Go sign up right now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. And if you like what you saw, please give us a like. And please, please, please think about subscribing because that really helps the channel a ton. And I will see you in the next video.